Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to be our Savior. As we look at this scripture, I pray that uh, you would open us to receive from you. Amen. Amen. Well, last Sunday was uh, Pentecost. Um, and the thing about Pentecost is uh, there is an implication to Pentecost. Uh, and after preaching last Sunday uh, about how Jesus uh, left us in order to send the Holy Spirit to us, uh, I mentioned that this week I would be speaking on the implication. So I want to be true to my word. Uh, and it just so happened uh, that the set reading for this morning is, was John 3. Uh, it, it's one of my favorite passages, um, but it's just, uh, I, I didn't pick it, it just popped up. So the implication, are you ready for this? Well, some of you are. <laughs> Ten days ago, uh, at my uh, institution and installation, I still can't get around, or get over, what a ridiculous thing that is. Anyway, uh, ten days ago, if you came to that occasion, the bishop uh, exhorted us to be apprentices. Do you remember that? Um, apprentice, which of course is the same word as disciple. And Jesus had 12 apprentices. Now that statement in itself has an astonishing implication. Jesus had 12 apprentices. Because what do you do with an apprentice? Well, an apprentice is there to be trained up to do what you have been doing. Ultimately, to take over from you. And that's exactly what Jesus had been doing. He'd been training up a group of people to do what he had been doing and ultimately to take over from him. The implication is we have the potential to live the way Jesus lived. to see the world the way Jesus saw it, to do the sort of things that Jesus did. And in fact, in John 14, Jesus goes on to explicitly say this. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. They will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus actually says that we can live like Jesus, do the stuff that Jesus was doing. That's an incredible implication. It's astonishing, isn't it? And this is, I believe, at the heart of why one night, 2,000 years ago, Nicodemus came to Jesus to ask Jesus how can we live the way that you live? How can we connect to God the, the way that you do? How can we do the stuff that you're doing? How can we live out like you? Came to Jesus that night. Well, let me tell you a little bit about of my story. I first came to uh, meaningful faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior when I was aged 13. Uh, and it was around that time that um, my parents had noticed that I was sitting ever closer to the TV. And um, at the point when I was sitting right in front of the TV and no one else could see it, uh, they decided that they should take me to the optician. Um, because something wasn't quite right. And they took me to the optician, and sure enough, it turned out that I was short-sighted. Uh, and I got prescribed those wonderful NHS black plastic glasses, which looked absolutely hideous back then, 
and since then have become super chic worn by Hollywood A-listers. You know, my time just had not yet come. Uh, so, but I, I, I remember to this day the journey back from the optician with my new NHS glasses because my face was literally glued to the side window of the car. Uh, because as I looked out of the car, the whole world had changed for me. Uh, all of a sudden, I couldn't just see trees, I could see every individual little leaf on the trees. I couldn't just see people walking down the pavements, I could see their faces, I could see their expressions. It was like a whole new world. And of course, this was a very similar time, it was around that time that I came to faith in Jesus Christ. And the two events are really closely associated in my mind because I've come to see that my getting my first glasses is almost like an allegory for my conversion. The day I got my glasses, my, uh, my world was still the same, the circumstances were still the same. It was still the same and yet Everything had changed for me. Everything was new. I was seeing the world in a completely new light. Uh, everything made sense for the first time. And I knew an incredible kind of bubbling joy in my heart to see this wonderful world that had been shrouded from me up until that point. It was like new life. And that was just with glasses. And my conversion brought a fresh reality of God into my life. God was everywhere. I, I, I sensed his presence with me every moment of every day. It was like a whole new world had opened up to me. It was as if I had been born. Back to Nicodemus. Who was Nicodemus. Well, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, so he was a member of a, a, a strict sect of elite Jews. Uh, he was uh, also a member of the uh, Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. Uh, so he was a senior elder amongst the Jews, the sort of person who you would step aside from as he walked down the street in his flowing robes in Jerusalem. A really important figure, a big cheese. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, in secret. In other words, we know from that that Nicodemus was a genuine seeker. He was not like those other Pharisees who came to Jesus during the daytime just to kind of cause trouble. No, he had genuine questions. And he knew because of his high public position that he could only ask those questions if he came to Jesus in secret. And he comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, in effect, he says a statement. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. It's a statement he makes to Jesus. But then it says, Jesus replied. In other words, Jesus answered his statement. Jesus takes Nicodemus' statement as a question. Because there is an implied question in Nicodemus' statement. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. What is the implied state, uh, question behind that statement? Well, I think that it is something like, 
Nicodemus saying, Jesus, I can see that you are connected to God in a way that is beyond my experience. How do you get that connection? How can I get that connection? And then Jesus answers him that implied question. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You can't see it. It's like you're short-sighted and haven't got your glasses. You can't see it. Everything's vague and obscure. Unless you're born again, you just can't see. Now, at this point, uh, I need to um, give you a little bit of background. Um, the concept of being born again was not new to the New Testament. It didn't start here. Uh, it was a common idea in first century Judaism. We can list at least six ways by which you could be born again. In, those, in their culture. Uh, first way was if a Gentile converted to become a Jew, it was said that they had been born again. Now, that wasn't open to Nicodemus because he had been born a Jew, uh, so it didn't apply to him. Uh, second way was if you were crowned king of Israel, it was said that you were born again. Well, that way wasn't open to Nicodemus either because he wasn't of the royal line. The third way would be when you had your bar mitzvah at the age of 12, when a young boy was declared a man in a ceremony. They didn't call it a bar mitzvah back then, but they had the equivalent. In fact, in Luke's gospel, we've got an account of Jesus going to Jerusalem, age 12, and he would have had a ceremony in the temple by which, at that point where he was declared a man. Um, Nicodemus would have been through that at the age of 12. Uh, so he had done that one. Then when you got married, it was said that you were born again. And uh, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And Pharisees were married. So he was married. He had done that one as well. Then when you were ordained as a rabbi, which would have happened at the age of 30, uh, it was said that you were born again. Uh, and Nicodemus was a, a member of the Jewish ruling council, so he was an ordained rabbi. He would have been through that one as well. And then the final one, when you were appointed Rosh Yeshiva, who was the head of the rabbinic school in Jerusalem, taking the title Rabban. When you attained to that post, it was said that you had been born again. Now, it's an interesting point that in verse 10, Jesus refers to Nicodemus. He says, you are Israel's teacher. It is just possible that Nicodemus had been appointed Rosh Hashiva as well. The man standing before Jesus that dark night was Rabban himself. So when Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again, Nicodemus is incredulous. He says, he says to Jesus, how can someone be born when they're old? What's he saying? He's saying, in effect, look, Jesus, I'm an old man. I've been round that block. <laughs> I've done it all. <laughs> what are you saying? You're asking me to crawl back into my mother's womb? I mean, he becomes flippant, doesn't he? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus says, in effect... Well, yes, Nicodemus, yes. You, you haven't, 
You haven't even begun. You may be Israel's teacher, but you haven't even begun. It's as if you're still in the womb. You haven't even been born. Now, when you were in your mother's womb, and we've all been there, haven't we? Um, when you were in your mother's womb, a fetus can hear and see certain things. They can, uh, fetus can hear loud sounds like um, people shouting or a door slamming or something like that. They can hear that. A fetus can also see bright lights. You know, if mum is toweling off in front of the light after a shower, the fetus will see some bright lights. But the baby fetus has no way of interpreting the sights and sounds that they are seeing. Everything is vague and obscure and the amniotic fluid just gets in your eyes and ears. It's only when a baby is born that he or she starts to see and hear the world in a way that they can grow to understand. Everything becomes clear and meaningful. Now, we've tended to reduce the idea of being born again to just salvation. And it certainly is salvation, but it's much more than that. Much more than that. Today, if you have not been born again, you are probably confused. Maybe you are seeking God, uh, but he feels obscure, he feels distant, confusing, out of reach. You just can't see. You can't see. It, it doesn't make sense. And Jesus says to you this morning, you need to be born again. You need to be born to start to see things more clearly. Maybe you know that you have been born again, that you've given your heart to Jesus, uh, and you know, you, you know that, and yet you're still confused. Uh, and God remains, he feels distant, he feels a bit obscure, a bit remote. And perhaps you need to be born again, again. Um, because if you're feeling that, you're in exactly the same position as Nicodemus. You need to be born again. Because when we're born again, a whole new world opens up to us. Where God is so real where the world is such an amazing place to live by faith, where we can sense God, we can sense the movement of his spirit, that we can hear God's voice, we can hear him speaking to us, showing us the way, that we can see him move in our lives and in other people's lives around us. We think back to Jesus and his apprentices and the astonishing implication that we have the potential to live the way that Jesus lived. To do the sort of things that Jesus did. To see the kingdom of God. To see it. Now, you've read your Gospels. You know, you, you know what the way Jesus operated. The sort of things that he did. That he went around healing the sick casting out demons, getting all sorts of supernatural knowledge about people and situations, communicating the good news of the kingdom in the most incredible, powerful way. Friends, the astonishing implication for us is that we can live like that.
It's incredible, isn't it? We can live like that. Not in our own strength, of course, but under the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, having been born into this kingdom. We all need to be born into the kingdom and so receive the Holy Spirit to empower us so that we can see, we can start to see the kingdom the invisible kingdom that is all around us of God at work in our lives and in the lives of the world around us. Do you want to see the kingdom? Do you want to live the way Jesus lived? Um, I actually wrote a book on this. Uh, and this book is called The Wind Blows Wherever It Pleases, which, of course, is in John Three, verse 8 it was in our reading uh, because we are called to live our lives like that the wind blows wherever it pleases you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going so it is with everyone born of the spirit does that describe your life is your life like the wind where you're not sure what's going to happen next. Maybe you're going this direction. Maybe you're going that direction. Maybe you're going to have a, a, a word of prophecy over somebody. Maybe you're going to lay your hands on someone and heal them. You don't know what's going to happen next. It's like the wind. It's powerful but invisible force living through you. Does that describe your life? Well, read the book. Anyway, so um, where have I got to? Here's a quote from Eugene Peterson just to finish. Here is the church, ordinary people filled with the spirit of Jesus to live as Jesus in our world. So that's my challenge to you, St. John's. Here we are. This is us. This is St. John's. This is you, to live as Jesus in our world, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you offer us the opportunity, the potential to be born into the kingdom of God to live our lives the way Jesus lived his life on earth. To be so filled with the Holy Spirit that we can live on a completely different plane. I ask you now, Holy Spirit, to come and open up that way of life for us.